Hello, my name is Sean Boyle, and I work at Southern Illinois University in their automotive technology program, and we are going to look at 6L80, 6L90 transmission tuning and the displacement on demand, and we're trying to figure out a way to make these torque converters live in these transmissions. So this video is going to be broken up into three sections. This first section, we're going to talk about displacement on demand, and we're going to cover how it affects transmission operation and also what happens when it fails. In the second part, I'm going to look at torque converter clutch, and we're going to take a torque converter clutch apart, and we're going to talk about some of the failures that could occur inside a torque converter, and also some of the solutions that are out there. And in the third part, we're going to look at the HP Tuner software, and we're going to see what technicians commonly do to modify these transmission control modules so that these transmissions can live. So before we get too deep into this topic, let's discuss the elephant in the room, tuning. And a lot of people are skittish about tuning. They're, they, they read things like this little document here that was produced by the EPA, pointing out that you don't want to mess with emission devices, especially as a shop, you're going to be, get, you're going to, if you get caught, you get a huge fine, and that would be bad. But the thing is, if you read through this, they're really pointing out things, especially diesel, the diesel side of things, you guys have got to be careful if you're modifying diesel stuff. Um, you know, they're actually pointing out diesel oxidation catalysts, EGR, selective catalyst reduction. These are physical parts or when they identify things like diagnostic trouble codes or the onboard diagnostic system, if you're going in there and telling it to ignore emission-related stuff, that's a, a big issue. But as far as the stuff that we do in the transmission world is altering torque converter clutch application and maybe even disabling on the engine side displacement on demand, or active fuel management, dynamic fuel management, basically the four-cylinder mode on an eight-cylinder, is that really modifying emissions? We kind of balance that like, What's the difference between emissions and what's the difference between fuel consumption? And they are completely different. If they weren't, when they improved the emissions on diesel trucks, the fuel economy would have increased as well. But what happened is that the exact opposite occurred. Even if you're old like me and you remember back in the, uh, the, the lean burn carburetors, they got incredible fuel economy, you know, 40, 40 plus miles per gallon, but they weren't good for emissions. So what they do when they came out with fuel injection, your fuel economy actually dropped when, you know, when you're looking at those vehicles, and uh, but the emission levels also dropped. So the economy got worse, but the emissions got better. So to further convince myself that displacement on demand and stuff like that isn't really an emissions-related device, you can see right here, this is a document that Art linked to on his um, TransLogic page on Facebook. You can see here the GMC Sierra and the Silverado. Both those vehicles because of the chip shortage that we're seeing right here in 2021, good old chip shortage, that they're removing those functions from the computers so they can save those chips for other purposes. And so a, a certain number of these vehicles are actually being produced and shipped without active fuel management or displacement on demand. So without having to recertify and all that kind of stuff, this engine, now is it gonna affect fuel consumption? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know how they're able to just omit this on a vehicle without having to change the window stickers for fuel consumption and definitely without it affecting emissions. So it must not affect emissions if they're able to pull this out out of production vehicles and consider that, okay, everything else is, is still there. All of the, the lifters and um, the solenoids and all that, it's all still there in those vehicles. Only thing they're doing is modifying the computers so they don't have the, and the software so they don't have the ability of turning on displacement on demand just because of the chip shortage. So that right there, in my opinion, is a pretty good rationale for why you can, as a technician, with customer's consent, of course, disable displacement on demand. If GM's able to do it before these vehicles actually roll off the assembly line, then I think you should be able to do it as well. I made a little video, a time-lapse video of me taking it apart to get to the DOD devices, and I'll try to narrate this. So you can see I took like the intake manifold that's coming off there, this is a nice clean engine. Everything came apart super easy. A little uh, noise dampener there. Those are the high pressure fuel lines. You're supposed to replace those if you ever change them. And then of course, here's our nice little fuel rail. That fuel rail came out super easy. That's not gonna be the case when we're working on something with some mileage on it. Um, high pressure fuel pump, camshaft driven. The fuel line attached to it, so there's the fuel control actuator attached to it, and then the high pressure pump. Like I said, you gotta, you gotta wish that every fuel rail would just pop out like that. You got four injectors, you get a little bit of carbon built up on the tip of that, it's not gonna wanna come out that easy. They actually make special tools to kind of slide hammer those out, but didn't need that. Like I said, it's a fresh engine, donated. 
So this is the VLOM, the variable lift uh, oil manifold. And you can see I've got four solenoids here. And those four solenoids control the four cylinders that can be deactivated. One, cylinders one, four, six, and seven. So actually you can see the little oil pressure holes that go down to the valley where the lifters exist. And that's cylinder one right there. And those are the passageways, right? Oh, it's moving on me. Those are the passageways that when that solenoid activates, the oil pressure goes in there, finds its way to that lifter. So here you can see I'm taking it apart a little bit further. I've got the spark plugs out, the valve cover off, the, the exhaust manifold out. And before I get in too deep, you can see the oil pressure holes. This is cylinder seven. These are the rocker arms for seven. Those are the oil passages that the variable lift, the solenoids, the DOD solenoids, would activate through that, uh, those passageways right there. And what they'll do is when, there's, when they're energized, a lot of oil pressure go in there to unhinge or unlock the uh, solenoids um, or the lifters. And when those lifters open up, these two valves right here are gonna stop opening and closing. So you'll see that. Now I went ahead and actuated it by air. So you can see right now that's where the air is going in. And those are the two valves or the two rockers that you're gonna see there stop moving because the lifters were disabled and then I re-enabled them. You can see right here they're operating. And then with air pressure in it, right now, they stop operating. I'm just cranking it over with the starter motor. I then take the air off of it and they reactivate. So I'm just using an air gun and I'm just kind of pulsing it. Now, what pressures do they do that at? If you take a look over here, I got about two PSI sitting there. And as I'm raising the pressure up, you're gonna see when it gets to about 20 PSI, right? All right. Now, they deactivate. So they need 20 PSI to release that lifter. And then when I lower it back down, they both start working at about 15 PSI or so. So uh, there's a little bit of a hysteresis or whatever you want to say. Now here I've got in blue, I've got the pressure off my handgun. And then this is cylinder pressure. You can see I just blasted it in my uh, okay, now I took the pressure away, so they're operating again. When I apply pressure to it, you can see they stop moving. And we can see how it affects the cylinder pressure. And the timing is important when they activate these solenoids. They need to activate it like when it's on the exhaust stroke. Because if they don't, you're actually going to have a buildup of pressure in there. And it's going to work. You know, it's still going to be like an air spring, but you're going to be building compression. If you do it at the right timing, you're going to have very little pressure. So if you see this, like that pressure spike there was in the intake stroke, this one's going to be more towards the exhaust, if I remember, right there. And you can see when that occurred, since that the, the actuator shut the valves on the exhaust stroke, so it never got a chance to take an intake pulse. It never The valves never opened up on the intake stroke, so when it closed, it didn't have air trapped in there. So the exhaust... The, the uh, piston moved up on the exhaust stroke, and then both valves closed, and then it just kind of created a vacuum. And now it's working as a little air vacuum pump, if you will. And uh, now it's back to normal. You can see I did it again. Activated it during the exhaust stroke, and you can see it maintained a low pressure. So that's a, kind of a, a, a little example of um, what, what's going on in there. Here you can see I operated it. It actually was on the intake stroke at that point. So that's why it built up some of that pressure in that cylinder. So timing is important, and um, it is something that you need to kind of, not like you need to do anything about it, but just be aware of during this operation that these solenoids are being turned on and off at specific sequences. And these newer systems, the dynamic fuel management system, where they've got a DOD lifter for every cylinder, and they've got 17 different modes where they can apply and release these things. So it's more advanced than the DOD that's been around since 2005 on the Trailblazer. They converted this over to the dynamic system. And on the dynamic system, they've got um, you know, a lifter for every cylinder and they can operate in a bunch of different modes. That's just showing it when you're doing it during the exhaust stroke that you're gonna hold a little bit of pressure in there. And that slide before that was showing it during the other, any other stroke that you'll trap air pressure in there. This is taking it apart a little bit further. I got my rock arms coming off. So this way we can get down and take a look at what's going on in the lifters as far as that's concerned. And pull my, uh, my push rods out, pull my cylinder head off. And now I'm gonna go in there and pull the little cradle or the little bucket that holds the lifters. There's a normal lifter that's not DOD. And then this is the DOD lifter right there. 
They're obviously roller lifters. This right here, this little spring, is going to kind of keep pieces in contact when they're in that release mode. That larger oil hole is where the fluid from the solenoids go into the release and apply it. And when you assemble it, that little guide there that I pointed at, that fits into that little slot right there. It kind of allows it to slide back and forth. Pretty cool. Um, and this was just because it was a pretty cool looking engine. You know, when you take this thing apart, the reliefs, this is a direct injection. So they're spraying this fuel in from the side right into the cylinder. And uh, it's, a, it's a neat design. It's a 6.2 liter Corvette Stingray engine. And we've got the luxury of just basically using it as a training aid here at school. Now don't beat me up too much. I'm not much of an artiste. So this is the best rendition I can do of the way these lifters are designed. This is an actual lifter that we see here. We can see the roller that operates on the camshaft. And I simulated those rollers there. There's little needle bearings and so forth. This is the lifter body, everything that we see. See that big hole right there? That's going to line up with these big holes right there. And the small hole right here is going to feed what would normally be a hydraulic lifter. And we would see that coming through this little hole right there. So this part from here on up is basically just a normal lifter where we've got oil fed into it. It kind of maintains a volume of oil inside here to remove the lash or the clearance that we've got between the rock arm and the valve. And um, oil will pump up through the push rod, the lubricate the upper valve train. But all this stuff down here, this kind of everything we see in red, that's going to be a little different. That's what's going to make the active lifter um, or the DOD lifter uh, unique. So the way it operates, is we're gonna have this spring right here pushing these plungers outward and they're gonna latch into these little slots that are built into this lifter body. And then when we want this to release, basically we want the lifter body to be able to go up and down without transferring that actuation to the inner lifter, the actual hydraulic lifter that we're um, familiar with. They'll put oil pressure through this passageway there and that oil will find its way around and push those plungers in up against that spring force right there. So when those plungers get pushed in, now they're not latched into the outer body anymore, like they are shown latched here, but they're unlatched there. So the outer body can then sit there and move up and down around this stationary um, inner lifter, if you'll call it that, and the valves will remain closed. And then when they want this to engage again, they'll release the oil pressure, and the spring that exists between those two plungers will push the plungers out and it'll grab into the outer body, and then now, the body will push that inner lifter and it'll travel and operate just like a normal lifter would. So that's the way that they're designed. Uh, they do run into issues. You know, sometimes this little latching mechanism gets burred up and it doesn't grab. Oil pressure is a really big thing. You need, as you saw with the examples, you need a 20 PSI to push that in and it doesn't, the spring doesn't push it out until about 15 PSI. So if you're low on oil pressure, these things aren't going to engage properly, um, and that is something that actually set a DTC and, and so forth. But not all these valves have these DOD lifters, unless you've got a late model vehicle that's got the dynamic fuel management that's going to operate potentially on all cylinders, so they can sit there and mix it around. But most of the earlier units that have active fuel management, or what we commonly think of as displacement on demand, that's going to be cylinders one, four, six, and seven, so four cylinders. Problems that exist with displacement on demand as far as our transmission operation is concerned. Well, if you look at the way how these transmissions are operated software-wise, they'll bring torque converter clutch operation on as early as first gear. And um, so first, second, third, all the gears, all six gears on a 6L80, 6L90 could potentially have torque converter clutch application. Well, displacement on demand isn't really a gear-driven component. It's more of a load-driven component. So if you're lightly on the throttle, they might apply your torque converter clutch in second gear or third gear, and then also start to apply this four-cylinder mode. And next thing you know, you're transmitting all these vibrations into the cabin of the vehicle. So vibrations at low speeds when the torque converter clutch is engaged, that is a very common complaint with displacement on demand or torque. A lot of people mistake it for a shutter. They think the torque converter or something in the transmission is creating a vibration or shuddering during application because it comes and goes. But in reality, it's just displacement on demand, turning on and off, on and off. So that's actually a pretty common issue, vibrations at low speed because torque converter clutch application and displacement on demand. And that can actually lead to this next issue, which is torque converter clutch, piston, uh, the friction lining hub and the spring damage inside the torque converter, mainly because at that low speed and the vibration and the, tor the torsional vibration that's occurring is pretty hard on that torque converter. So this vibration right here, it was from a 2011 
Tahoe, and it had a pretty bad vibration at about 20 miles an hour. You could see it when it went to four-cylinder mode, and you felt it because the torque of her clutch was trying to apply at that same uh, speed or around that speed. I use this little homemade vibration analyzer that it, we make and we use in some of our classes, and I, there's a link up there to it. You can go through and see how to make it yourself. If you have a scope, uh, like I said, 20 bucks or so, you can make this analyzer. It's pretty cheap and it's effective. It's three axes, so X, Y, and Z. I, I measured all three when I was doing this. I just drove and put this on the steering wheel while I was going down the road. And when this thing went into four cylinder mode, it created a nice um, rhythmic pulsation. So in this video, you could see that this thing is operating in four cylinder mode. You can kind of tell by this rhythmic pulsation that's occurring here. And when the switch is the eight cylinder mode, you're gonna see it's gonna get more random. So you can tell right there, it switched to eight cylinder mode. Mind you, I had this on the steering wheel, so I'm feeling every bump and even every turn. But you can tell when this thing acts up, and it's really only acted up and created a, a, a noticeable vibration at low speeds. Right there, you can see it went to four cylinder mode. And because when we're driving this thing, if I had a camera in there, I wouldn't have been able to show you anything. But this will actually represent it in a scope format. So you could see there's the normal eight cylinder mode and a little blip where it looks like it went to four cylinder for a second there, tried it again. And it's all load based. So at this speed, it's on and off quite a bit. And then you could see it's turned it on for a little lengthier time. But it's, it's uh, amazing when you're driving at 20 miles an hour that it switches between eight cylinder and four cylinder mode just for like a second or two. So it's obviously not an effective um, device, either fuel consumption or definitely emissions device when you're driving that slow and the thing's kicking on and off, but it definitely creates drivability complaints. So that's the reason why when you look, if you were to guess when this thing turned on, right there, you're in four cylinder mode and then it turned back off. If I were to drive highway speeds, I wouldn't pick this up because the engine speed's going fast enough, the uh, vehicle's going fast enough, I wouldn't actually be able to see. It wouldn't be an extreme vibration and it wouldn't be a nuisance. That one there, you could tell, you'll feel it and hear it in the vehicle. So that concludes part one of this three-part video series. We just covered displacement on demand. The next video is gonna cover torque converter clutches. And I'm gonna take a torque converter apart in front of you. We're gonna show all the pieces and parts, talk about what fails inside them, talk about some aftermarket solutions, and I'm gonna give you my opinions on some of the things that I would do if I was overhauling a 6L80 and I was concerned about the torque converter clutch. So see you at part two.